in his book, Unto Us is Born, Tyler Mayfield re recommends for Christians to read the book of Isaiah with a pair of bifocals. With one lens, we are told to use our near vision to see how the church's liturgical season shapes our reading of Isaiah. And with the other lens, we are to use our far vision to see how our understanding of Judaism influences our reading of Isaiah. And tonight, Mayfield urges us to read the poetry of Isaiah with both near vision and far vision so that we might see Isaiah's message clearly and responsibly. On Christmas Eve, the church unrolls the scroll of Isaiah and our eyes land on the familiar words, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. The beautiful poem is full of vivid imagery, but remains virtually empty of historical markers to events or actual people. Such poetry keeps professional and armchair historians busy searching for clues. However, one biblical scholar suggests that the poetry's great enduring strength may be its ability to transcend a particular period and speak into multiple historical situations. Whether under Assyrian or Roman imperial control or trying to navigate through the politically charged climate in the United States today. We understand the poetry of Isaiah's darkness and light. We too associate life and goodness and wisdom and hope with light. And a darkness conjures up for us notions of evil and chaos and fear and death. Our far vision finds the poetry of Isaiah 9 tucked in with a collection of other poems dated in the late 8th century B.C. And perhaps Isaiah 9 belongs to this period. And if so, the prophet's words were first uttered to an ancient and weary people in need of comfort. These people lived centuries before that auspicious night in Bethlehem. Isaiah knows not of our swaddled Christmas infant. He has not witnessed the cramped manger featured on our greeting cards or seen the star appear overhead. Isaiah penned his poetry long before Christians existed in the world. He knows nothing of Mary or our Christmas carols. Our far vision affirms what the Apostle Paul wrote of the Jewish Bible, our Old Testament, and his letter to young Timothy stating that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Creatively, the prophet Isaiah turns to poetry to give three reasons for the increased joy of the nation. Three indications as to why they ought to believe a great light has pierced through the long night of darkness. Three concrete explanations why the people ought to rejoice as people rejoice at the harvest. Isaiah proclaims, first, that their oppression has been broken. Second, weapons will be destroyed. And third, the birth of a child. What is obscured by many of our English translations is that most of the verbs in Isaiah's poem are written in the past tense, an already completed act. And for the Jews, they heard that when they heard the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, those who have lived in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. When they heard these words, they logically concluded that God heard their cries of hopelessness and despair. 
and that God had sent them King Hezekiah to illuminate the dark world with God's hope and new life. In other words, the poetry of Isaiah 9 functions as part of the coronation for this new king as they honor him as wonderful counselor and prince of peace. These are the kinds of qualities Judah seeks of the one enthroned over them. But as Judah honors their God-appointed king, they simultaneously lift up the name of the Lord who has proven over and over to be a faithful and mighty God. The Old Testament is replete with stories that celebrate the many ways God has protected and defended the chosen people. God has a long track record of caring and providing for Judah as a good and everlasting father would their children. And when we look at the poetry of Isaiah 9 with far vision, we can affirm this to be an acceptable and valid and responsible interpretation. Leaving us with a question such as, how will we help the new king promote endless peace? Or where could we assist the king with his policies anchored in God's justice and righteousness? Upon whom in this dark world might we reflect the light of hope? Tonight as we sit among the soft glow of candles, we are suddenly aware of the darkness on the other side of the window pane. And we might be filled with excitement, the excitement of Christmas, but, but we know a weary world saddled with fear awaits on the other side of these walls. Of people living in deep darkness. The darkness of loss, loneliness, and feelings of inadequacy. The darkness of a current crisis or an anticipated one. The darkness of a confused or wavering faith. The near vision of Christmas Eve invites us in from the fields and the outskirts of the little town of Bethlehem. To read Isaiah's poetry anew. We cannot unhear the angels' nighttime announcement to the shepherds. Do not be afraid for see I am bringing you good news of great joy. For all the people, to you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. The gospel writers work in concert with one foot in the, the Old Testament, another in the New Testament, as they demonstrate how Jesus is the once and coming light of the world. Matthew specifically quotes the poetry of Isaiah 9 to introduce Jesus' ministry when he writes, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, those who lived in a land of deep darkness, and then light has dawned. The gospel writers understand Jesus offers liberation as one Easter hymn would later write from the dark domain. Justin in the second century made a radical and bold move when reading Isaiah's poetry when he insisted, when he insisted that Isaiah's poetry not only spoke of King Hezekiah long ago, but gave us a way to talk and to understand the birth of Jesus. Especially in the words for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. On Christmas Eve, the church marches out one Christmas carol after another, helping us to understand Isaiah's poetry with the near vision of our Christian faith. Tonight we gather to reflect upon the wondrous birth of Jesus, the newborn king. A king who shares with us the very heart of God. A king who shows us the ways of God. A king who saves us from sin. A king who redeems us from death. A king who dispels the darkness with his light. 
A king who breathes new hope into deflated lungs and defeated lives. This evening, this child whom we celebrate was born for us. He lived for us. He died for us. He was raised for us. Maybe the near vision of reading Isaiah 9 means we are not left cursing the dark, but blessing the light. Perhaps it means that as we work to establish God's justice and righteousness in our community and promote God's peace in the world, a peace that surpasses all our understanding, that we, like Mary and the shepherds of old, might find ourselves this evening lost in wonder, love, and praise, reflecting the light of God's love and grace not only among ourselves, but to a people who walk in darkness. I offer this to you this evening in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said,